Hello, wrestling friends. I'm Matt Coon, which means you're listening to FTR with Dax Harwood. Not just Dax Harwood, but the Fightful.com in-ring wrestler of the year, Dax Harwood. Dax, when we started talking about this, I didn't know you were going to be this big deal. Like all this stuff happened to you <laughs> after we talked about it, and now you're, you're you're a big deal, and that is a big deal, isn't it? Yeah. Well, come on, come on, dude. I've been a big deal. Let's give me a little bit of credit. Uh, but you know, I want to be humble and stay humble. But I can't let you forget. Also, Fightful.com Tag Team of the Year, Fightful.com Tag Team Wrestler of the Year, uh, PWI Tag Team of the Year as well, and you know, uh, maybe some more to come. We'll see. But uh, I got to stay humble. I can't. I can't brag too much. Can't be too braggadocious. But at the same time, it must be nice to have these accolades kind of add up after really, really not getting any for yeah. a long time, right? I mean, that's that's kind of a big turn of events the last year or so. Yeah, I, it's, uh, I mean, it, you know, because these awards that I've won are fan voted awards. Uh, it means a hell of a lot more to me because I don't put... Uh, I've said it before, and I'm sure I'm going to get a little heat from this, a little backlash from this, but I don't mean it disparagingly. I don't put a lot of faith in one person's, and I'm not just speaking of Dave Meltzer. I mean, in general, uh, one person's star rating, you know, uh, or what one person thinks of my match. It's the mass, the multitude of people, the fans. That's, that's, that's what I care about. Um, you know, I've never, ever, ever, ever in my career, 19 years, August will be 19 years that I've been doing this. Never once have I ever thought of or structured or formulated a match to try to get a five-star match. It's never even crossed my mind. How can I make this a five-star match? Never once crossed my mind because it doesn't bother me. It, it, it's cool that people like Dave Meltzer or Brian Alvarez or uh, Wade Keller or whoever, it's, it's, it's fun and it's cool that they enjoy my work and they enjoy my matches. But it's also fun and cool that uh, Chad sitting in fourth row, you know, in uh, fucking Poughkeepsie, wherever, it, 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 he likes it too. Or when, you know, a father brings his kids and the kids are in love with the match or after the show, me and cash, which happened all the time. We, we stayed after the show, after a match and signed autographs and went through the crowd and shook hands and, you know, hug people. And these kids come up to us and their parents say, these guys are the, the, these kids are huge fans of yours or they adore you guys or they love you and or they they love the fight like an eight-year-old girl story uh you know th those are the things that that mean a lot to me because i understand now or understand with that uh that i'm touching people emotionally and that's all wrestling is is touching people emotionally um so yes, it's cool that I got those awards and it's cool that I'm getting the accolades uh, because all I've ever wanted to be is considered a great wrestler. You know, all I've ever wanted to be is a wrestler, uh, but being uh, a great wrestler and being, you know, considered one of the best in the world is uh, something I never thought would be. I always had confidence in my abilities, but I never thought it would be a possibility because of what I look like and what I am to the, to the business. But um, I think the fans tastes in wrestling has matured. And uh, I would like to think that I've matured as well as a wrestler along with them. And uh, we're all along for the ride here. Well, you know, at, at the same time, you didn't think you could do it, but you didn't take no for an answer so long and you kind of made it happen. Um, you definitely made it happen. Of course, everyone knows um, what we're going to talk about today a little bit. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, the subject today, which is your AEW debut. But before we do, um, I, I'll i tell you what I can't stop doing is drinking this tequila right here. Uh, <laughs> this is an amazing gift from you, Dax Harwood. Thank you so much. I love it so yeah, much. Yeah, of course. And I think my taste just got a lot more expensive. But you have a different tequila of the week this week, don't you? I do. I do have a different one. I've never tried this one before. Um, hold on one second. It's behind me. I'm going to butcher this name, um, but it's Siete Legas uh, Reposado. 
And this one is um, another one that's been aged uh, in whiskey barrels for up to 12 months. And it's 100% organic. This particular one is 100% organic, um, additive free. Um, and everyone raves about it. And it's really hard to find here in Western North Carolina. So I'm very excited to, to try this one. Um, let's see what the description says here. Um, the description says, according to Surgeon General's, women should not drink alcoholic beverages during pregnancy. Uh, that's not the description. So I'll let that go. Uh, but yeah, it was, um, <laughs> that's a hell of a tequila. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 100% organic certified. Um, so yeah, let's try it out here. And this one I would like to dedicate to my good friend, uh, Jay Briscoe, um, who we all just lost, um, less than a week ago as we are recording this now, uh, he and I and Mark and cash, uh, <laughs> we'll get to talking about it later, but we enjoyed tequila together, uh, all the time. And, uh, it was always a pleasure for me to bring a different tequila and f to see, uh, to see both of them smile and enjoy it as much as I did. Um, so here we go. We'll try this one out. Like I said, never tried this one before. So we're just testing it out here. I'll give you my honest review. Uh, it wasn't super expensive. I'd like to say it was like $59. So not too bad, but a lot of the uh, tequila snobs online, they put it over huge and say it's awesome. So here we go. And this is drink number one for the day. I, I think there's going to be a couple today. Yeah, I think so too. All right, dude. This one's for Jay. Jay, I love you. I miss you. Matt, cheers. Cheers, my friend. To Jay. Ah, this is really good. This is really good. A lot of times the, uh, the organic ones, the, the no additive ones, ooh, that's really good. It like gets better as it sits there. A lot that, of the, that is a ringing endorsement right there. Yeah. Uh, that's wow. Um, yeah. A, a lot of times ones that are completely organic or additive free, like uh, they have a, a big bite to them, um, but not this one. It's so smooth, dude. Like this is really good. I can smell the, uh, the pepper and the citrus. Oh, this is real good. Oh, dude. <clears throat> Hello, way to start a show, huh? Yeah, this might be my new favorite Reposado. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, wow, man. That's really, really good. It's, I mean, you, you can, you can taste the pepper in it. You can taste the agave. It's not like, like the class A where you can taste because it, you know, the class A was, um, the class A was rested for three years, if I'm not mistaken, in whiskey barrels. So you can taste like the, the whiskey ish caramel vanilla flavors in there. This one, man, it's, it's all pepper. So if you're, if you're not a it's pepper and citrus. So if you're looking for like a, I don't know, like a fruity smooth drink to drink, this might not be it, but man, this is really good, dude. And I noticed, so, uh, this one, the Class A Azul that I have here that we drank last week is a little darker. Uh, is that from being in the Whiskey Bros longer? A, a little bit longer. Uh, maybe maybe the Class A is not three years. Maybe it's the Class A Anejo that's three years. The Class A is in there for, for, for longer than this one. Um, but this one is also, could, could be because... It, the distilling process and where they put the, where they put the, uh, the agave and like, it could be like wooden barrels. And sometimes the wooden barrels make the, the, the color of the, um, tequila a little darker. Um, and some, <clears throat> some are in like uh, stainless steel barrels and you don't get as much color. So that could be what it is. But, uh, yeah, this one's really good. Siete Legas. I'm, I know I'm butchering this. I apologize. L E G U A S. We're going to call it Siete Lagas, and because it's about fifty dollars, I think I'm going to pick up some myself because you have such a, a love for it, wow. and uh, it's off to a good start. Of course, really I good. had a heavy pour myself, and you had a heavy pour yourself because of the toast that you made. Um, I don't think we need to introduce it much, but a tragedy, just sudden, terrible. I I don't know what to say. You're my friend, and and I guess I'll just the floor is yours. Um, Jay Briscoe. Yeah. Uh, so we talked about the fightful.com awards and 
they asked me to speak on the awards that I won. And I, I did. That was a few weeks ago. And I spoke on those. And, you know, again, very proud of what I accomplished, what me and Cash accomplished as a tag team, but also what the four of us, us and the Briscoes, accomplished as um, dancing partners and uh, what we did together for wrestling, what we did together for ourselves. And it was, you know, it was a relationship that as soon as we met, uh, as soon as we talked, um, you, you knew something was there. Uh, you know, they're from Delaware. We're from North Carolina. So little similarities, but also some differences too. Uh, but when you got, you know, when you got guys who were uh, self-made, uh, you know, worked all their lives, um, and you know, almost come from nothing. You almost have to form a bond because there's not too many people like that in the in in the wrestling world. Uh, and we just immediately hit it off. Uh, but but I, I wanted to record another video for Match of the Year uh, for Fightful.com. I felt it was necessary to dedicate that award to Jay, and I felt that it was necessary to let people know how important he was to our legacy to our, our 2022 uh and to me in, in general personally um you know the 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 pwi tag team of the year world word award easy for me to say uh is is dedicated to jay i, I will dedicate it, it that's dedicated to jay because i would have not me and cash would not have won that award without Jay and Mark Briscoe. Um, they carried our careers through 2022. And, you know, 2022 was a year that, selfishly speaking, and maybe egotistically speaking as well, um, I, don't, I don't know if it'll ever be recreated for another tag team, like the way that, that we, were, we were able to, to do it. Um, we had incredible dancing partners in 2022, three with the Briscoes, uh, one with uh, the Young Bucks, one with um, Aussie Open. Uh, we, 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 we had um, Punk, and Mox. Jeff, Punk and Mox, Jeff Cobb and Ocon, Great Ocon, uh, Drillistico and Dragon Lee. Like, it went all over the world and did it, man. But uh, without the three matches with Jay and Mark, we wouldn't have had any of this and we wouldn't be as revered as we are now. Uh, and I honestly feel that for the rest of my life, I'm going to be able to take care of my wife and my daughter through this one year and this one year because of the trilogy of matches that I had with Jay and Mark. Um, we, we first met Jay and Mark at Final Battle 2021. First time we ever met, first time we ever talked. Uh, the first time we met them was in the ring. Uh, we slid in the ring, and they knew that we were going to bring it, and I think they knew we were going to bring it, uh, and we did, and we weren't going to back down. And I, I didn't know. you know, I'd heard great stories about these guys who personally, who they were, uh, what they represent, um, and how they treated people. I heard great stories. But you never know how you're going to mesh with someone. Um, and also, you know, they're considered one of the greatest tag teams of all time and maybe the greatest tag team of our generation. And I wasn't going to go into that uh, event quietly and let them think that they were better than us um, and they were tougher than us and they were more badass than we were. And, and Cash had the same thought, too. You got to hold so, your own against those badasses. Oh, you know? my God. Yeah. yeah, you got to hold your own against everybody. Yeah. Um, you know, Those two in particular, the only time in my life I ever felt a pang of fear at a wrestling event was for the Briscoes. And it happened twice. You know, sitting close by and watching them come by, they're just their character, their take the wrestling out, just the way they presented themselves mm -hmm. were just these legit, tough, dangerous badasses. But meanwhile, Jay's just the greatest guy in the world behind the scenes. Right. And, you know, uh, you know, full transparency they they are they're both badasses and if they got to throw down they'll throw down in a second uh you know they they're they're not worried about it at all and, and that's what i respect about them is you know that's what i respect about them when i first met them is 
we had been on national TV for quite a while and we had a reputation. They had a reputation too, but we had a mainstream reput- reputation at that point because we had been on uh, worldwide television for, for a few years and they didn't take one step back when we jumped in the ring at final battle. And immediately I had a lot of respect for that and everything we were given them, they would give right back to us. If we brought it here, they would bring it here, maybe a little bit higher. And we had to catch up with them. Um, you know, and, and then afterwards we talked and, had a great talk and we were excited about the future. There was no, uh, there were no plans for FTR versus Briscoe's. We just wanted to test the waters. Uh, We just wanted to see what was going to happen. Myself and cash really were uh, in a lull lull point in our career. We weren't doing anything and we begged Tony to, to let us do that. And um, but you guys started tweeting at each other before there was any kind of idea or plan, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, Again, uh, in 2021, we really, you know, the whole year we had, we had nothing. Uh, and it was one of those things where pre anxiety, um, because my anxiety was June the 4th, if I, if I'm not mistaken, or June the 6th, one of the two, uh, but pre anxiety, I took all that to heart. Uh, I was, I was very frustrated very upset and very angry like at everybody, man, sure, uh, sure. not, not just, not just Tony or the EVPs. I was angry at everybody because in my opinion, we had taken this risk and come over here to make a name for ourselves, to make a, to, to build a reputation, not lose one. And I felt like we were losing it. And so, uh, you know, if we were, if we were going to, if we were losing our reputation, we weren't going to go down without fighting. And those were some guys that we were always tagged in on social media as to, we want to see this match. We want to see these, these, uh, these two teams go at it. And so we, you know, just started trading verbal jabs, never met each other, never DM'd each other, never talked to each other. Um, and then, you know, again, we had nothing to do, uh, nothing of substance, really. We, we had just had the match a couple of months prior with Darby and Sting that we were so happy with. Um, but, but other than that, man, we were really kind of lost, you know, a ship without a sail, I guess. And we begged Tony if we could make this appearance at, at Ring of Honor. And I don't think Tony necessarily knew... Uh, I think he knew he was going to hit. I think he knew the, 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 the company was his at that point, but he didn't know what was going to happen or what he was going to do or what the future was for ring of honor. Uh, but if we could drum up some interest, maybe that would help. So we, we did that at final battle. And that's the first time we met him. Uh, awesome experience with those guys. And then we moved to Supercard of honor and uh, you know, I don't want to ever give away too much of the magic, especially especially with that uh, that trilogy. But putting the match together at Supercard of Honor was such a breeze, so easy. It was it was a pleasure uh, hearing the philosophies they had, um, contradicting or comparing and contrasting whatever the philosophies we had was so beautiful to me. Like it was such a learning experience for me. Um, so you were good dance partners in and out of the ring. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I mean, we, we had a lot of respect for each other personally and professionally, but personally, because both those guys are uh, family men. Uh, you know, obviously I'm a family man too. And we also both had something to prove, you know, like I said, our 2021 wasn't the greatest. We weren't proud of it. Not not any besides you know a couple of matches here and there we weren't proud of what we had accomplished since we've been to AEW we'd had some bright spots like you know being the tag champions or whatever um but we weren't really necessarily proud of what we had accomplished yet and we knew there was more that we could accomplish and on the flip flip on the uh, here we go on the flip side of that the briscoes knew that or no no they didn't know excuse me they didn't they didn't know what was going to happen with ring of honor and so they're like, well, we, we got to make a statement for us too. You know, like we, we don't know where our future lies, what we're going to do for the future. And so they, they were of the same mindset as us, even though we weren't the main event and we felt we should have been, or could have been the main event. Uh, we wanted to steal the show and we wanted to, uh, 
we wanted to steal the show, but we also wanted to make it logical as to, to, to our characters and to our story as well. Um, and it, we knew we could go if, if, if they were going to go out, if ring of honor was going to go out, we, the four of us could go out with a blaze of glory and say, this is who we are. This is what we represent. And we deserve a job somewhere. We deserve to be on national television every week somewhere. And that was our mindset going into it. Uh, and then the match happened, man. Oh my, it was fucking magical. You were there for that. I wasn't there for that, but okay. I was there for final battle. I was there when you walked in the ring. I have a picture and it's also a gif of you guys entering the ring. So I'll send that to you because that's the first time you guys met right there at final battle. But mm -hmm. that first, you know, and we'll, this is, we'll talk about the wrestling. We'll get to the real world in a second, but that match changed everything it changed everything for you and it changed everything for the briscoes i it's it's hard to imagine a tag team match where both tag teams benefited more in real life than that first match that you guys had yeah it was something we both needed uh, you know all, uh, both teams needed like i said and i feel like you know n not by itself but i feel like it helped usher in a new, not a new, but it helped usher in um, a reintroduce a style of wrestling that maybe had been missing for a while, but also upgraded to 2022 standards. Um, I feel like it ushered in a, a mid South kind of feel uh, mid Atlantic kind of feel uh, almost a, you know, a, a late nineties wrestling kind of feel too, but with, with some of the false finishes on the back end, but also if you look at the match, if you watch the match, there was no, and we'll get into a deep dive. I'm sure we will. And I don't want to go too much into it, but there were no convoluted spots. You know, there was no dipping and dodging and up and down and through the legs up on the shoulders down. You know what I'm saying? It was, it was all punching and it was all kicking and forms and simple uh, reversals and things like that. And just, we just beat the shit out of each other, man. We, we really did beat the shit out of each other. Um, so I'm, I'm so proud of that match. I'm so proud of that moment. I'm so proud to be part of that with them. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, we were going to take a break. And we didn't know what the future again for us was. Um, and then we move on to the two out of three falls match from death before dishonor in June. I believe it was June or July. Maybe, maybe it was July. And, you know, we didn't, you know, I told you this before, but we didn't want to go into a rematch that soon um, because we didn't want to cheapen what we had just done at Supercard of honor. But uh, Tony wanted this match, and uh, he believed in this match, and he wanted the two out of three fall stipulation. And one you know, might I, say he needed this match too. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I think from my so. Viewpoint. And, and honestly, that's what I told him when when he texted me that. He said, honestly, to be honest, Tony said, "Would you guys? I, I know you don't want to do it, but would you mind doing this match?" And I said, Tony, I was thinking about it the other day, and I think this pay per view needs the match. And I, you know, I don't say that with any egotism. I say that, uh, you know, as a fan looking from the outside in, I think this pay per view needs that match. Um, and so uh, the match went forty three minutes or something, um, and it was it was a beautiful piece of art, and it was something that hasn't been done in wrestling in a long time, man. I, I feel we started off slow. And we built the drama, you know, we built it with, with every fall, but also with every change in, in, in drama and twist and turn in the story. And, you know, the, the first match we had, Cash and I were presented as the bad guys, as the heels. The second match we come in and we're almost equals, you know? And so the, the four of us, we have to toe a careful line because the fans have love for both teams. And so we have to structure this match really, really, really smartly because if one of us leans too much into being a heel, then we might lose them because the fans didn't want to boo either one of the teams, you know? So if, if one of us leaned too much into being a heel, they would, they would not buy into the match. We just had to be us. The four of us had to be us. And I'm so proud of that match, but we were all so nervous. And again, we'll go into a deep dive of this match later. But uh, 
<laughs> I don't think I'm going to get in trouble for this, and I don't think I'm going to get anybody else in trouble for this. That's but, my favorite way you start sentences. By yeah, the way. we'll we'll yeah, see. My favorite. Way. <laughs> uh, but surprisingly, that day uh, I had brought Classe Azul for the four of us to to have afterwards to 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 celebrate afterwards to celebrate the Super Caravana match to celebrate how uh, the the pay per view buys that Tony had already told us were the the pre pre sale buys. Uh, but, but also to, to celebrate what I thought was going to be another great match to both of our legacies. But it's also how you, I think, I'm, I'm pretty sure about this. I think that's how you show your appreciation and love for people. Like <laughs> buying them a drink or and breaking out a bottle, uh, fellowshipping them with, with a little bit of tequila. I think that's kind of the Dax Harwood, I love you. Absolutely. And, and, and not just uh, alcohol uh, in general. That's... That's my, I guess, love language. I guess that's what they call it. Where you, I, lo- I love. Oh, look at you, yeah. Buying people things, like I'm not this super. I don't, I don't. Uh, I'm not big on showing emotion, and I've tried to get better at that with my my wife um, over the last decade or so, because there was a time when we first started dating. I was, I tried to be this you know, the stand up, uh, chest out kind of man where I didn't show emotion because I had to be the man for the woman. And, uh, and I realized like, that's not what she wants. I don't even know if that's what any woman wants. You know what I mean? I, I think they want a man who's going to be, uh, emotional and, and, and show them emotion, just like they want to show us emotion, you know, and want us to be a real human being. Um, so, so I'm still struggling with that or still working on that. Uh, but I love buying people things. I love, that's how I think I can make them happy. But yes, the camaraderie, uh, bringing a bottle of whatever, um, and that, that's just that's just how I yeah, that's how I do it. Anyway, so before the match, we were all like scrambling our brains because we were worried. Like, what if we don't deliver this time? You know, like what if we don't match up what we did before? What if we don't come close to matching up? You know, right. that could be the end of our careers. And we were all so worried. And I said, uh, this was you know. A couple of hours before showtime, I said, "Hey, would you guys you want you want to take a shot before the match, and maybe it'll loosen us up and get our, you know, our creative juices flowing?" And they're like, "Fuck yeah, the the Mark and Jay, fuck yeah, they they were waiting for me to say that, you know." And I think as wrestlers, because I've never ever ever besides that one time, I've never ever ever had a drink before a match, you know, because you don't. You just don't, you don't want to go in there and, and hurt your opponent or, or mess up or There's a lot whatever. of reasons why not to. Yes. It sends a bad message. It looks right. professional, all that yes. kind of crap too. Yeah. But the four of us were under the impression that we needed it and we all had it and we had the shot and then we started talking and started feeling good. And then uh, <laughs> Jay says, Hey, what about uh, what if, what if we take one more of those? You know? <laughs> and they, they had never had class A either, and I was like, okay, let's do it. So we yeah, took another giving one. someone one shot of class A. That is not cool. You got to you nah, got to follow it up, keep right? Going. So yeah, let's do it. So the four of us take another drink, and uh, you know, and we're sipping on it. We're we're putting together this what we think is uh, this great match. You know, we're laughing and having fun, and then. Someone speaks up and says, well, let's do one more. Just one more. We got 45 minutes to go <laughs> oh, no. tonight. We got to do one more. So we did, a, we did another one. And by the time I realized that we had drank half the bottle of Classe before the match. <laughs> and we, you know, more than putting the match together, we were just having fun and, and you know, talking about our family and our families and um, telling stories. And then we'd go back to the match and then we'd get out of it and start laughing again and having fun. Uh, and when we go into a deep dive, I'll tell you more about the, uh, the inner workings of the match. Anybody but, come close to catching you, catching you drinking that day? Oh, uh, well, uh, I don't want to, nah, I don't want to put any names out there because I don't want to get them in trouble, but yeah, I mean, yes. Uh, but that person understood the four of us trusted each other enough that, uh, we knew nothing was going to happen and I, we I could stop love- ourselves. Yeah, I just love the picture of you guys just sneaking drinks and the vice principal walking in. You're like, yeah. we're good, we're good, it's yeah. fine. <laughs> yeah, and so, you know, going out to the match, uh, we're walking to the curtain right before our music hits, and we're still putting stuff together, dude. It was so crazy. Uh, but then we go on to have what I perceived to be another classic and another match that I loved. And at that point, it was my favorite match I'd ever had. 
Um, and then, you know, the dog collar match, which we went into a deep dive earlier. My favorite match of all time. Uh, the greatest story I've ever told, we've ever told, me and Cash. Uh, and those guys had no reservations, no worries. They had to stop me from doing stupid shit. Uh, you know, like I, I remember I wanted, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember I wanted, uh, I, <laughs> I asked Mark, I was like, uh, I said, what if I'm, what if I'm laying down and like I'm laying on the ground and you take the chain and you wrap it up and you just, you just hit me across the face with it. You know, like oh, if, God. If, if I'm laying down and you swing it in my, my mind, I'm thinking, well, the brunt of that is going to be at the top of the, the, the fucking, whatever it's called in, in math, the, the, the parabola. Yeah. yeah, sure. That's what it's called. And it's going to hit the ground. Boom. And I mean, I'm going to feel it and it's going to hit me and whatever, but I won't get the smack, you know? Uh, and he was like, uh, <laughs> I don't think I'm comfortable doing that. And then the other two cash and Jay are like, fuck, no, you're not doing that, dude. No, we're not going to do that tonight. Uh, so more than anything, they had to make me watch out for myself. Um, but man, you know, I, I implore anybody to go back and watch that match. Listen to you and I, uh, our deep dive on the dog collar match and my thoughts, putting it together, their thoughts, putting it together and how we came about. But then uh, Tuesday, uh, Tuesday evening, my family and I, me and Maria and Finley, we were playing, uh, babe, Maria, uh, she's gone. Sorry. We were playing some board game um, and uh, I got a phone call from Tony Schiavone and I picked it up and he said, hey, Dax, uh, I have some bad news for you. And he said, we tried to call your partner and we couldn't get an answer. So you're the first person we've told, uh, because we know how close you guys are, but, uh, I died in a car accident and I just, I lost all feeling like I couldn't even, I couldn't, I couldn't even cry. You know, I, I, I couldn't, I, I just lost everything. Like, and I didn't believe him. I, it was so weird. Like you hear these the, the cl almost cliche stories of like, no, it's not real or no, it didn't happen. But that's really what happened to me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't comprehend what had happened. Um, and then he told me about his daughters, you know, and what had happened to them. And I couldn't believe that either. And, you know, it's, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I didn't know what to think. I hung up the phone with him immediately called cash. He answered and I told him, and I think the same thing happened to him, man. It took him about 15 seconds of saying, no, no, you're lying. And then he broke down and cried. And then I broke down and cried. And, <clears throat> and then my wife and my daughter, uh, decided to go upstairs and they said, we're going to give you a minute by yourself. So they went upstairs and, <clears throat> and I, I lost it. Like I lost it, you know, and I told you this the, the day after it happened, uh, I lost it, man. I just started sobbing and then this is going to sound weird or whatever. But again, I told you this, it was like an out of body experience. I could, I could see my, I could see myself crying and I, I watched me cry. And then I heard myself cry. It was the weirdest thing in the world. And then I, and then I came back to my, God, it's, it sounds so stupid. And then I came back to my body and every picture that I could, Oh, every picture that I, have ever had, whether it's a video or a match or a picture in my phone, every picture I had with him flashed through my eyes at a million miles an hour. It was just going bam, 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 bam like that. And then I had to stop. I had to pull my head out of my hands and I had to breathe and I had to stop for a second. And then, I, and then everything just came back to me. And um, it was, it was, so surreal dude and it's still so surreal to, to, to think about it um 
but uh, yeah, I, I, I owe so much to him. And I, you know, for all the shit we get as wrestlers, you know, from the fans who apparently love us, and there are some that are great, dude. Ma the majority of them are great. Let's put it like that. The majority of them are great. And I'm so thankful and s so blessed and fortunate and lucky to have the fans that I have. But for the few that like to shit on us, man, and uh, talk like, you know, talk to us like we're not humans. This is real life. Wrestling's not real, you know? And I don't mean in the ring. So I hope no one comes at me at that. I'm saying that's not real life, you know? This is real life. What's going on right now is real life. Um, what you see on TV for two hours or three hours or six hours a week, that's us trying to entertain you, you know? Whether it's us putting our life on the line and, and wrestling and bumping and going from the top rope to the floor or whatever, that's us trying to entertain you. And that's us putting our life in danger to entertain you. But this shit right here is real life. His daughters are struggling right now. And his daughters... His daughters are fucking struggling right now to... Uh, I shouldn't have said that for it, but they're struggling to, to get back to normal. And his wife, he, she hasn't even had an opportunity to struggle yet because she's worried about her daughters. And then when all this gets taken care of and when, and when life starts to get back to normal, that's when she's going to struggle, you know? And I just, I just hope that this, bring some clarity to a lot of the wrestlers, myself included, dude, myself at the top of the fucking list. I hope this brings a lot of clarity to a lot of the wrestlers who uh, put wrestling above everything. Because at the end of the day, it's, 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 uh, it's really not that important. Um, I'm not saying don't chase your dreams or I'm not saying don't put your best foot forward or try to be the best in it because that's stuff personally that's going to take care of you. I'm saying the shit we see on TV is not that important. Real life is important. The fans too, please understand that. Right. The shit you see on TV is not that important. It's the real life human being that's important. Is that That's important. Um, so those are my thoughts. Uh, Obviously, we lost an incredible talent, and I could talk about his talents, you know, ad nauseum. But more than anything, we lost a great human being who was way too good to be in wrestling. His brother is way too good to be in wrestling. Uh, if I'm being honest, Cash is way too good to be in wrestling. Uh, and the three of them are just attached to my dumbass because um, I was lucky to find all three of them. And I was lucky to have them in my life and I was lucky to have them in my 2022 and I was lucky to be able, and I am lucky and I will be forever lucky and grateful that I'm able to make a living off of the series and the relationship and the friendship that I have with the three of them. I was uh, worried about you a lot this week, you know, because you're such an open human being and I told you about my no, uh, my student Noah who died in February. He was 21 years old. I've known him a long time. And I remember when he passed away, the thought I had is, I want to help him. I want to make him feel better. Oh. It's the strangest thing, right? Oh, my God, dude. This right. Yes. Yes, dude. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but yes, that's that's me too. When something goes wrong in life for, for, for someone that I care about, my immediate reaction is, here's my wallet. Uh, what can I do to make things right, to right. make things better? What can I do for you? What can I buy you? What can I, what can I say to make things better right now? And I couldn't for them and I couldn't for, for, for him, for him. Yeah. and I, I couldn't for his family. And that, right. and that's why I felt so, I think I felt so empty because I was searching. I was searching myself to, I was searching myself to figure out a way to be able to help them. And I knew I couldn't, I knew I couldn't help them. And I knew I couldn't help Jay, uh, man. <laughs>
Yes. So, so uh, same thing. Same yeah. thing. And I was just thinking, you know, this kid died in a very similar way. Um, I just wanted to help him. I thought of him pain. I wanted, and then I realized I couldn't. So then I, I said, well, I can help those people around him. And his brother Josh came over and hung out with me one day, two days after it happened. And I wanted to talk to his parents, but his parents were busy and I didn't want to bother them. And then I realized I also need to take care of myself. That's what I can do for Noah. And I think for you and for everybody, you know, you can't help the people who are gone. And it's the first thing you think it's so irrational, but you can help those around them feel better and in doing so helping yourself, but also help yourself take yeah. care of yourself because <clears throat> that's what anybody that you loved would want for you after they're gone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and you know, I, I tried that and, and I talked to, to Mark a few times and I let him know, Hey, I, I don't want to annoy you or bother you because I'm sure you're getting a ton of messages and a ton of, ton of calls. Uh, you know, but, but I just want you to know that, Whatever you and your family need, me and Cash, we're going to make sure they have. Whatever those girls need, we're going to make sure that they have it. Uh, I'm going to do everything I can to uh, make sure that his family is taken care of the way that I see fit. And I'm, I, you know, I'm not the richest man in the world. Uh, I don't make. Uh, I don't make the kind of money a lot of my peers do. But damn it, I will, I will try my damnedest to monetarily, um, spiritually uh, take care of that family as long as I can possibly take care of them. Well, we're going to have a banner somewhere, but it's worth definitely uh, worth mentioning. Uh, give send go dot com slash P U G H. L O V E. That's give send go.com slash P U G H L O V E. That's a pew love. And they've already raised um, some money, but do this battles just beginning mm -hmm. uh, for this, for this family. And um, I guess I just want to uh, uh, say to you that I'm sorry. It's the first thing I said to you when I got online with you today and our, I hate the term thoughts and prayers, but our best thoughts and our, if you believe in prayer, of course, you know, yeah. uh, go to the I, family as well. I can tell you with 100% certainty that Jay would either be making fun of us for being um, so sappy or having so much sympathy for him, or he'd be mad at us. Uh, I, I know that for a fact. Um, and to, to finish the, <laughs> to finish the, this, you know, the thought on Jay, the last conversation we had was about two weeks before he passed away. And, um, we had sent messages back and forth about how much, you know, we loved the dog collar match, but how, you know, how, how our bodies were holding up and, uh, you know, things like that. Like I, I always, and he, he did as well. We always tried to make, to check up on each other, uh, after matches and things. And the last text we sent, which I said was two weeks before, uh, he passed away. I just sent him a picture. <laughs> well, I said, I sent him the text and I said, Hey, both of us are happily married men. Right. He said, right. And I said, I didn't say anything else. I sent him a picture of my ass. <laughs> and, uh, it was, it was, I guess two weeks ago was about, or two weeks before he passed away. It was about two weeks afterwards and it was still black and blue. <laughs> and, uh, I said, you know, I, I said, well, here you go. And I sent him that picture <laughs> and his immediate response was a picture that he sent from here up of his forehead. And he had uh, all these bruises and cuts all <laughs> down his forehead from the chain. Uh, and it was, you know, it was still there. Um, and that was like the last text we sent each other. Uh, great human being, great man. Um, I'm glad he's getting uh, the flowers he deserves as a person. Um and Jay, I love you. I miss you. And maybe I'll take some uh, classy with me when I see you again, brother. I'll probably edit something in right here. Just so um, it's just that, uh, that's a transition that I am not uh, good enough to make. You want to take another drink? Yes. Do we want to do this online? 
Oh, wait. Are, are, have you finished yet? Oh, no. I, this is my third glass. This is, oh, shit. Uh, I got to catch up with you. This is, it's no good, man. It's, it's just, it's such a, man. But, you know, here's to you, buddy. Here's to you, dude. Thank yeah, you. Man. Of course. Well, guys, we're going to do best as we can. <laughs> Dax and I literally just took a break and took a drink. Um, we're going to do the best that we can to provide you guys what you like, which is what wrestling <clears throat> gives you, which is a break, a break from the real world and a fun little jaunt into what's often a more fascinating world, the world outside the ring of wrestling. And today we're going to talk about, Dax, you guys arriving and the debut of the FTR newly named FTR, in AEW. You ready to get started? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Well, the story kind of starts with a lot of little Easter eggs, <laughs> some maybe you knew about beforehand and some you did it. 2017, that was a long time ago. Cody Rhodes starts with the Fuck the Revival stuff. Starts with it, it becomes a bit, it becomes a meme, it becomes FTR, it becomes FTRR, it becomes... All this stuff, but but there's there's super cuts on YouTube of Cody saying "fuck the revival" several times. Uh, what was your reaction to that, and did you know about it ahead of time? Um, I, I, honestly, I did it. I mean, maybe it did start in 2017. I thought it started one year prior in 2016. That that was our uh, that was our big breakout year. Um, no, I had we had no idea, not one idea that was going to happen. Um, we were. You know, uh, we found out about it from social media and, you know, uh, at first I was like, ah, whatever, this is cute, you know? Uh, and then it kept going and it kept going. And then I heard, you know, I've told you about this before, but I heard the interview with Cody where he said that, uh, you know, I, I felt that he was taking a shit on cash and I's legacy and saying that we practiced our wrestling matches before you know, the big, the big takeover matches. <clears throat> and I, I felt like he was trying to, to downgrade us a bit because he was burying us on the Sam Roberts podcast, comparing us to the, the young bucks. Um, uh, you guys are developmental. The bucks are always on tour and yeah. the comparison isn't apples to apples for that reason, that kind of stuff. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He said they can go in with any type of talent and have a great match, but that, or, uh, Dawson and Dash, they have to uh, practice their matches before. And that really bothered me because, like, uh, don't try to downgrade what I do. And, you know, he and I have talked about that. We talked about it as soon as I, the, the very first day I arrived in AEW, he and I talked about that. Um, but yeah, no idea about the uh, fuck the revival thing. Um, uh, we had never met the Young Bucks. We had, I, I mean, I think I'd met Cody before, but we had never met the Young Bucks. Um, and what I think, and the reason I think this happened is because for so long, for so many years, these guys, Nick and Matt, had been the perennial tag team of all of wrestling. You know, obviously independent wrestling, but they were catching fire and, you know, rightfully so. They were having great matches and, you know, doing things on their own accord, but they were catching fire and, and you know, they had been the perennial tag team for wrestling for for a few years with not and a real they, close second place either. no you know, no they were I, of, I, you know, the, the guys you know yeah i can't think of anybody that was coming close to, to second place to them you know and then here come these two five foot ten southerners well, i've said that a million times but two five foot ten southerners and we are the antithesis to what they are and what they present and what they believe in as far as wrestling goes uh i feel felt at the time i felt at the time so before anybody goes to melts or any of my uh, colleagues so sorry about that i felt at the time that they took wrestling as a joke and we took wrestling seriously i felt at the time that they based their matches around high spots and moves which is totally okay there's there needs to be uh, there needs to be a difference in styles because if everybody wrestles the same, it's boring and we change the channels. So I'm not saying it's wrong, but I, but I, I felt that they based their matches around moves and uh, high spots. And I felt we based our matches around um, hope spots, hot tags and drama. Uh, 
Again, not one is right or wrong. God dang. So let's go ahead and get that out there before I get buried by Alvarez and Meltzer. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so we were the complete antithesis antithesis to them. And now in 2016, people are starting to take notice of this, these guys and the best way maybe in their mind to, uh, to, to, to not keep up with us, but I, I guess the best way to maybe, um, maybe knock you down a little bit, maybe knock us down a little bit, but I, you know, I don't think that it was a malicious thing. Who knows? It could have been. I don't think it was a malicious thing. I think it was a, uh, this is our characters, the, them. This is our characters. And we would make fun of that. And they're, you know, fucking, they're right on our coattails. They're, they're right on our heels for being the best tag team in the world. So let's kind of, you know, let's, let's, let's poke at them. Let's make fun of them. Right. And uh, I think that's where that came from. But also in a world of wrestling, uh, you got to understand, I, or at least I thought, think, whatever, maybe I think now, not everything is off limits, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you mean not everything is within limits? We, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, 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 I'm so sorry. I was still thinking. Not everything is, is, is okay. It's not, right. not within limits, you know? Right. Uh, Certain you, things you know. don't get, like talking crap about somebody traditionally in wrestling is about, you know, what they say getting you over, right? Right. But I've seen that sometimes people, hide behind that guise of getting you over as plausible deniability just to shit on you. Right. right? And, and, and it could be something like that. Yeah. And so, so initially, you know, we, we didn't necessarily, uh, we weren't upset at first and then I was like, all right, this is getting a little too much, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, the, the little chubby, uh, sixth grader came out of me and I'm like, okay, I'm getting tired of being called fat. So I don't have to knock you the fuck out. Uh, you know, and, and that happened. And then we were told by management not to respond, not to say anything. We couldn't tweet anything. Uh, we couldn't make any videos. We couldn't allude to them at all because they didn't want, uh, they didn't want those guys to have any press or anything like that on their accord on their dime. Right. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the, the fuck the revival thing. And then it took a life of its own. And uh, we were like, you know what, if you're gonna, if you want to make it something, we'll take it and we'll put a spin on it. And it's forever the revival. And that's what it's been. Uh, and we, we made it our own and I don't know how and we may talk about it. I don't know how in the hell we were allowed to get FTR on our tights uh, the last year of our contract, uh, or the last year we were in WWE, uh, I, we didn't care. You know what I'm you saying? You guys like, had like kind of a fuck it mentality, right? Like, yes. You're like, okay, motherfuckers, right. tell us, tell us not to, tell yes. us not to. But I, I'm just surprised we never were told, okay, don't do that. Uh, right, right. But you know, that's it's that. always a little surprising to me. You know, um, with Cody. Because I know Cody, you know, he's Dusty's dad. Like, he has an appreciation for that Midnight Express, Rock and Roll Express, and might maybe, perhaps, have an appreciation for you and this podcast. You know, I think it started as a way kind of to kind of give some attention to you guys, but then as it became a bit and on and on, it became a different thing for you. Yeah, well, it was weird because it went through almost a roller coaster for me and then for Cash, too. I think I don't want to speak for him, so we'll just talk about me. So at first, I was like, ah, whatever, you know, who cares? And then I was like, oh, you motherfuckers, come on. But I couldn't sell it. You know, I knew I couldn't sell it as a professional. <laughs> right, right, uh, right. And I'm like, these motherfuckers, if I ever see them, I'm going to yeah. fucking knock them out. Dude. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, and then it got to the point where I was like, oh, God, it's kind of cute. I can't get too mad at it. Like, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe they're great guys or you know whatever but uh it was yeah like i said it was like a roller coaster man i was okay then i got real pissed off where i wanted to kill not kill not kill god dang don't call the authorities i wanted to fight somebody and i was like oh no they're you know they're it's they're, they're harmless yeah it's yeah. wrestling it's um wrestling. and again like you said cody who is constantly working you know he's always working so that that's that's what i chalked it up to so things, you know, started, the seeds got planted, and then a couple years later, just out of the blue, it seems, Matt Jackson mm -hmm. lays out a tweet one day 
the Young Bucks will face the revival, the world will rejoice. And then, um, of course, you guys were told not to tweet about him. So, of course, uh, one Dash Wilder <laughs> right. responded yeah. and said, one day uh, the revival will face the Bucks and the world will rejoice. Um, had you guys talked at all at that point? No. Um, like as, as friends or people or peers, nothing like that? Not at all. So that not shit was just happening, huh? Just happening. Um, I mean, I, I think, you know, the four of us knew that there was money there, uh, at least on the scale that, you know, uh, maybe not on a national scale like WWE, but I don't know. Independent wrestling was becoming Bro, pretty national at the time. But they were on a roll, too. They were about to sell out a 10,000-seat arena. Yeah. And they were like, so the idea, and also... It's not like you guys were being thinking, "Hey, we're going to be here in the WWE for ten more years." Oh, you're yeah. thinking, "Hey, this this is a thing that we're maybe Dude, leaving for." When when he tweeted that, I think, and like I said, I'm I'm not lying to you. I, I we had never talked to them, but I think less than a month later is when we asked for our release. So it was all you know. It, things were starting to to be put in place for what was eventually going to happen. Of course, a lot's been made of you and the Bucks, and we're going to talk about that uh, deep deep dive at some point for sure. But I think part of the allure of, of Revival going to AEW was this intriguing matchup, much like you and the Briscoes, this conflict of styles, mm -hmm. of credible, elite no pun intended, level tag teams. Uh, it must have been, as a creative endeavor, you must have already been kind of thinking, I wonder how we're going to approach the match if and when it ever happens. Dude, I'd already been thinking about the match <laughs> in 2016. <laughs> so I don't know if we want to fast forward this much, and we can talk about it later when we, we go into a deep dive with the Bucks, but the, the finish we had for... Um, uh, God dang, what was the pay-per-view? Not full gear. Was it full gear? Yes. Full gear 2020. The finish that we had where Cash missed the 450 and then Matt super kicked him. I had that in mind since 2020. <laughs> because the whole no flips just fist thing, I made up <laughs> for me to over to, to compensate for the <laughs> shit I can't do. Yeah, instead of instead of saying, hey, uh, I can't do this, you're just indignant, like I right. won't do that. Right. Yes. <laughs> right. And so it became a gimmick. And I was like, okay, well, at least I can say it's a gimmick that I don't do this shit because I'm not, it's not beautiful when I do it. But Cash, on the other hand, is an incredible athlete, dude. He can do anything. I mean, I, I'm not giving well, you saw him do the 450, but he can do anything, dude. Like uh any kind of high flying move you want. Sometimes he has to, you know, I, I'll, I'll uh, I will offer things for him to do in our matches. And he's like, I don't think that's me, man. Or I don't think that's us, you know, uh, but I, I offer it because he can do it. And I, you know, sometimes I want people to see what he can do. Right, uh, right. But yeah. I, I knew how athletic he was and I knew he could, uh, cause I'd seen him do that move on the Indies before. Um, and so I knew that I wanted the story, the finish for that match, that we we had the, the the eventual match. I knew I wanted us to try to do uh we we wanted to try to one up them. Uh it was like, okay, fuck it. We we're gonna we have to, if we're gonna beat them, we're gonna have to get on their level. And so we crash and burn, boom, right. and then one super kick takes us out. One, two, three. So I knew that was the finish. So I'd I'd been thinking about the match for, for a long time, dude. And I was very, very excited for that match and uh, you know, a lot of other things. Leaving uh you know leaving your comfort zone to mm -hmm. try to win that match because you wanted to win as, as the bad guys and then paying the price, right? Mm -hmm. Of having to leave what was successful is what kind of made that ending of that match uh, compelling for a lot of us. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, one of those things where it was a story-driven match and uh, I don't want to go too deep into it because we got a whole episode we got to do about it, but story-driven match. Uh, I had actually talked to, to 
edge about the match uh, or about, excuse me, about the, the angle before we even went to AEW. I was like, how can I make this angle personal? And he gave me all these ideas about, uh, you know, how we can say that we left the biggest company in the world to come find them. They were too scared to come to our house or they were too scared to come to the, the biggest company because they may be relegated to a lower level because they would be um, exposed because of us. And, uh, it, you know, he just, again, another time we'll talk about it, but he is just so freaking smart. Adam, that is edge. So smart. But yeah, I'd been thinking about this match for a very, very long time. Uh, people wonder sometimes about the revival Adam Copeland edge connection, but y'all live in the same town, right? Uh, yeah. Adam That's and fine. I live. Yep. Yeah, we live about, I don't know, I'd say 10 minutes away from each other. But Man. he's fucking busier than he's ever been. I never get to see him anymore. Well, I'm, I, you know, good for him for everything he's doing, you know? Yeah. And, of course, that kind of just sets a little Easter eggs on the way. To, and, of course, combined with what we talked about last week, which is this perpetual compounding unhappiness based on complete reality and reasons to be unhappy. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to talk another time, again, about... You leaving the WWE, but April 10th, 2020, WWE.com says, effective today, WWE and The Revival have agreed on their immediate release from WWE. We wish them all the best in their future endeavors. Hell yeah. How, how I was going to ask you, <laughs> how was that day for you? Uh, every emotion. Uh, scared, happy, excited, worried anxious all of them you know and i don't even want to go through the emotions my wife went through she you know she had just you know after we had turned down the offer from wwe which was a crazy amount of money um you know she had said do whatever you think is right you know which is she's the, the greatest in the world but do whatever you think is right and when reality set in and we you know uh, finally got a release. I, I don't even want to, I, I don't want to know how she felt. She, you know, she finally told me how she felt, but I, I'd never want to put myself in that position because she was worried. You know, we left the biggest wrestling company in the world where we were making, you know, okay money. Uh, and, and we're offered much more. Yeah. And we're offered a shit ton more. And we left that to go into some uncharted territories. And, um, you know, she was, she was very worried about it, but you know, yeah, same thing for me. I was, I was every, uh, every emotion you can think of went through my mind, but we, we got the call and I'm sure we'll go into a deep dive of, uh, FTR leaving, uh, WWE, the revival leaving WWE soon. Um, was one of those emotions, one of those, uh, most dominant emotions was, did I fuck up? Like, were you thinking that at all? Like, did, did I just take my dream and throw it away because I can't be happy or whatever? Would, did that thing cross your head at all? No, I, I never, I never asked myself or thought to myself, did I, did I mess up? Did I fuck up? Um, that never crossed my mind. I was never worried about that because I knew that if I stayed with WWE, if we stayed with WWE, we would only get to a certain level. Um, you know, if Vince is not a fan of ours and he's not a fan of the division that we're working in, you know, there's only so much we can do. Um, and there's only so much that's going to make me happy there. <clears throat> and like I said in the last episode, if I become unhappy or if I become bitter and I bring it home with me, that right. makes it worse. My dad. And my mom, they both, I mean, they were separated, but they both worked their ass off and made sure that I had shit, you know, in my life. They made sure my life was comfortable. Not, not I don't want to say comfortable because there were a lot of uncomfortable times, but they made sure I was okay. And if they could do that for me, I knew that without wrestling, because I have two degrees, uh, because, you know, I, I know we'll be okay. I can make a living for my family and I can make sure they're okay. Um, so I, I never thought, did I fuck up? I was just worried. Uh, I, I was worried about, I think I was worried about, are we as good as we have tried to present ourselves as, you know what I mean? 
Right, right. And if we didn't match that, if we didn't match, if we couldn't match our 2016, then we were dead in the water, you know, because the people had, the fans had spoken up and they thought that we were just getting buried through throughout our main roster run. So if we couldn't match up to our 2016, then, uh, man, we were, uh, we weren't going to make it. Hmm. Well, things were happening though. Of course, AEW is launching everybody just assuming you're going to AEW. You talked last week about how you have peers, you have friends in the company that you talk to. Of course, no laws were broken, no tampering occurred. But were you thinking in your head, there's an opportunity for us at AEW like right away? Or was that not in your head at that time? No, I, I, I felt pretty confident that AEW was going to pick us up. Uh, I felt that they needed talent um, because they're building a roster. And I felt that there was some box office, obviously for us in the Bucks, but us in Santana and Ortiz, um, there was box office for for us in uh, SCU, um, for Omega and Page. I, I thought there was a lot of box office for us. And I thought we could uh, help because I've spoken about it before, not on the podcast, but in general, in general. But there's a difference between TV wrestling and wrestling wrestling you know there, there's a huge difference because they're there it's it's almost a, the tv wrestling is a television product and so you so when you're selling or or <clears throat> i mean we're always selling from bell to bell we're always selling but when you're selling you want to convey that to the camera and you want to show your facials and, <clears throat> and you want to sell with your hands and sell with your face and and show the people what emotion you want them to feel whether you're the heel or the baby face if i'm the heel and i'm on top and i want to show these people that i'm frustrated that i finally stopped this baby face i finally have allowed him to either slip on a banana peel or i've shitted him out of um out of uh, the goodwill that he was doing. I want to show these people that he embarrassed me and now I'm going to change a fucking gear and I'm going to change that fucking gear on him. And now it's my time. Now it's my time to show that I'm a badass. And so, so <clears throat> I knew that wrestling wrestling was about having the matches, you know, and as a, was, a, was about, you know, making the people happy, but TV wrestling was conveying that emotion, getting your character over, getting who you were, allowing the people to come inside and feel God come inside. Speaking of blue chew, uh, allowing the people to come inside and, 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 and feel who you are as a person, as a character, uh, as an entity. And, and with those facials and with those, that body language, that's what, that's what TV wrestling is about. And so I knew that, Cash and I had something to offer there. And I think they knew that as well. Um, so I was pretty confident that we would, we would go there again. I just, uh, I was, I was confident in us, but also very nervous about what we were going to going to deliver. Uh, you know, and you said you had a lot to offer, uh, and you felt you had a lot to offer. If you want a little bit more to offer blue chew, bluechew.com yeah because the nights are getting longer and the breeze isn't the only thing that's getting stiff that's right this episode is sponsored by blue chew guys we talk about all the time here confidence can take you far in life that's especially true in the bedroom especially when it's time to step up to the plate that's where blue chew comes in blue chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as viagra and cialis but in chewable tablets and at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. The process is simple. Sign up at bluechew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you receive your prescription within days. The best part, it's all done online. So no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA and prepared and shipped direct to your door in a discreet package. Now, um, Dax, um, I think you need to correct something you said last week. You said with the Blue Chew, you get to please your Greek goddess, and if everybody else takes Blue Chew, they can too. That's not quite the case, I don't think. No, what I meant was if you take blue chew, you can uh, you can please your own Greek goddess. But you know, uh, please stay away from mine. I'm fortunate to have her, and I don't know if uh, she understands uh, what this is. She, maybe she's blind. I don't know. I definitely out kicked my coverage. Uh, but yeah, man, you know, we just celebrated our uh, 14th anniversary 
just a few days ago. That's no uh, joke. 14 years. Congratulations. 14th year. Not married together, being together. We've been married 10 Still. years, 10 and a half Still. years, 14 years together. And, uh, you know, we finally got a babysitter. And like I told you last week, and we got a hotel room. And I just wanted to make sure that she was taking care of my mistress. Uh, I don't know if I can call her my mistress. I don't think I can call her that. That's fine. But she is to me. And uh, I wanted to make sure that this uh, this Greek goddess was going to get a little bit of my Spanakopita, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Or Taropita, depending on, you know. Uh, your preference. Uh, so if you could benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform, chew it and do it, have better sex. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. If you've been wondering if you should do it, give it a try. There's nothing to lose because it's free. When you use our promo code DAX at checkout, just let them know DAX sent you. You get it for free. You pay five bucks, five bucks shipping. That's bluechew.com promo code DAX to receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and safety important information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. Uh, Dax Harwood, um, this tequila is getting me drunk. I have to tell nice. you Nice, congratulations, what, dude. What are you, you going to do? What are you gonna do? That's, that's what it does. Hey, so we're... Um, <laughs> Well, real quick, real quick, sure. you know, you know, when you get drunk, sometimes you get the whiskey dick and blue chew's right there to help you out. So, you know, just have it on tap all time at all times. Okay. They, they should put whiskey dick in the copy, but maybe it, maybe it's in there now. Um, uh, we were talking about a W mm -hmm. and the fact that you were very confident that you would speaking of confidence you very confident that you would sign with them when were your fish first official talks with all elite wrestling and who were they with uh so uh officially i talked with um before uh, okay so the, the the day before the announcement that we got a release mark carano had called us and uh, he said, uh, look, I got some bad news for you guys. Uh, you know how we added on two months to Dash's contract because of his broken jaw. They didn't yeah. do the thing for your injury, did they? Well, uh, <laughs> you remember when we added two months on to Dash's contract for his broken jaw. Right. right? We talked about last week. Right. Yeah. yeah right. Uh, he said, well, uh, Dave, I'm sorry. We're going to have to add on four months to your contract for your torn bicep. And I said, Mark, you just told us, you know, just a, a few weeks prior that you were not going to add on the, the, the time that you would honor that. And you, you know, we, you gave us your word. He said, I'm sorry. That's Vince's call, not my call. And I said, well, you know, who am I supposed to trust now? Like you, you promised me that we were going to be done here in July. I think it was July, May, June. This is something we would be done here in July and we can go and do our own thing. He said, yes, I know, but it's, you know, whatever. Uh, so now you understand why nobody trusts Mark Carano. Um, <clears throat> so he called us the day before uh, they released, or excuse me, two days before they released the announcement and he gave us an ultimatum and uh the ultimatum we'll talk about on a later episode and the ultimatum was obviously a lopsided ultimatum all for them uh nothing for us we lost a shit ton of money uh which we should have our good personal close friend mike dawkins on to talk about that because he was right in the middle of it all yes sir but yes, uh sir. We lost a ton of money, especially at the time for me and my family, lost a ton of money to a, you know, a lopsided uh, agreement for them. But as long as we could get, could get out of our contracts, that's what we wanted. And so they let us out of our contracts immediately. Uh, well, excuse me, the next day was the official uh, contract being cut. And then the day after that is when they made the announcement. Uh, and so the day that Mark Carano called us, so two days before uh, the announcement was made online is when I immediately, you know, he called us. He said, you guys don't have to give us, give us an answer right now. Talk about it. And then give me a call back. <clears throat> so I called cash. We talked. Uh, we said, well, should we talk to Cody or the Bucks or Tony? Uh, he said, yeah, 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 let's do that. So we sent uh, the Bucks a text and said, hey, uh, there's a possibility that we may be leaving WWE. Would you guys ever be interested in having us? And he said, well, I would love to have you. 
And we said, that's all we need to know. So we called Mark Carano and said, yes, we agree to your terms. Uh, you know, uh, please give us our release and thank you. And he gave us our release. And right then is where we started talking contracts. Uh, as soon as, as oh, excuse me, as soon as the, 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 the following day, whenever the contracts were cut and we got the paperwork from Mark Carano, which I just saw the other day, which is crazy. I was going through my uh, Gmail, but when we got the, the paperwork from Mark that said we were officially released um, and we had no 90 day compete clause, that was our ask. Like, okay, if we give you all this and you take all this money from us, at least just let us not have the 90 days. Like, let us just you know, uh, go out and do what we need to do immediately. And he said, okay, we can do that. Um, the, so the very next day is when we started talking contracts with, uh, Tony Khan. So you made those initial contract talks with Tony Khan. Was it, was it hard to agree on money or was money was easy right away? Well, to, to be honest, you know, we, we just, we expressed how, uh, excited we were to work with tony and he let mega take care of the contract stuff and we let mike dawkins take care of our contract stuff uh it was very 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 easy uh i don't think we asked for much and you know i, I don't think that they asked for much out of us either i think that it was a mutual agreement and and we all wanted to prove something with this signing uh so we allowed mike to take care of the contract stuff on, on our end and mega was taking care of the contract stuff on their end. Man, it is so great that such a good friend of yours introduced you to such a great lawyer. It's really great. That that <laughs> happened, you know? I text him. I, I, I text him today, actually, right before we started the podcast and asked him about some things that were, would, would they be okay to talk about legally? Right, uh, which we may right. get into if right. you want to. I was thinking about sending him the clip too, because um, we're, it could be, I don't know anything about the law. Mike is a genius when it comes to that stuff. And he is a good friend of mine and I love the guy. Uh, Mike's exact real. words were Mike. I hope you don't mind that I read this on the air, but his exact words were talk away. Nothing secret there. And it's all in the past. So let's fucking go. I love, I love Mike so much. Yeah. Hey, do you know the story? This is the tequila. Do you know the story about, Mike uh, Conrad convincing somebody that Mike Dawkins was Chris Jericho. <laughs> Jesus, no. Oof. What's what's the name of the restaurant in Baltimore the horseman used to eat at? What what's that restaurant? Um, oh, Sab Sabatelli's or something. Oh, like that? yeah, the Italian place. Right. So we're all there. Yeah. I think Jim Ross is there, but a lot of Starcast people are there. Conrad's got a bunch of tickets for AEW, and the waitress goes. <laughs> The waitress goes, uh, uh, hey, are you involved in wrestling? He's like, yeah. Conrad is just the ultimate river, right? So he's like, mm -hmm. yeah. Matter of fact, that's Chris Jericho right there. Now, Mike Dawkins is bald, like right. bald as as Dax Harwood. And and she goes, uh, but he doesn't have any hair. And he's kind of like, it's a wig. And then she goes, can I take a picture? <laughs> so she took a, and, uh, I think it might have been me that took the picture. And there's there's a picture of it where the rest of the table is doing this. <laughs> We're so ashamed because this woman is going to post on Facebook she met Chris Jericho, but it's really Paul Mike Dawkins. That's uh, that's quintessential Conrad, right there. Um, so uh, back to uh, the all elite wrestling plans. You signed with them. When did you start talking creative? And uh, what were your expectations and who did you talk to that about at all? Uh, so uh, I, the only expectation that we had was we talked, we had talked to Cody um, in January of 2019. Uh, this is when they had, you know, there were nothing, there was nothing official but there were talks of maybe they were going to do something. And Cody and I were talking as friends and he said, you know, I'd love to have you and cash or you and dash here with us. Uh, you know, we would, if, if you, if you guys ever had the opportunity to come, we would make sure that the tag division was built around you guys and the bucks. And uh, you know, that that's the only expectation that we had coming in. Other than, and then obviously we expected to work with the Bucks at some point. But I remember thinking 
uh, you know, a few years after it happened, well, a decade after it happened, Hogan and Flair in 94, right? Uh, Bash at the Beach. WCW, right. WCW, sure. yep. I remember, you know, about a decade later, I'm in the business and I'm trying to, you know, figure out things for myself or like trying to make sense of a lot of things. And I always wondered why they in, um, immediately went with Hogan and Flair, you know? That was the match. That was the money match. That was the dream match we all wanted to see. And we knew that Hogan was going to pop a rating and he was going to pop a house, you know, a couple of houses just by coming in. So why would we initially put Hogan and Flair in that position, right? That was my thought. Like, right, right. why not give Hogan um, – I don't know. You know, for example, what if what if you gave him Steve Austin? Right, right. There, right you know, right. And, and let Steve Austin work with him, and and they have a they have a little program, and and one you know put Steve Austin in the same light as Hulk Hogan. Sure. But also let's let's ride the wave of Hogan coming into to WCW. You know, make the money off of that, and then when Flair jumps on board with Hogan, then we can continue to ride the wave. Right, and because the Flair match is already is is always there. Just right. like the Bucks and, and FTR thing. It's always there. You can always right. go to it. So why rush into it? So so with the Hogan deal, it's like they went Flair, and then I was like, okay, we're going to go to Booty Man or uh, Brutus Beefcake, you know? Uh, so it was kind of – it was a weird booking – decision to me and this is again me coming in to the business in 2004 and trying to make sense of things and even now trying to make sense of things so i thought coming in it you know we talked to the bucks about this and we talked to uh and yeah at the time we had a you know a cordial we had i don't think we had no we had never met them before we still never met the bucks we had only talked through text so we were sending ideas back and forth to the bucks to tony um and i remember thinking look People expect me and Cash to come in and jump Nick and Matt. They expect us to come in and just beat them down and let's go ahead and race to that. Um, I said, but we need to, I said, I think we can, we can wait on that a little bit. People are going to be excited because at the time, you know, at the time there weren't a ton of people just jumping to, to, to AW, you know what I mean? Um, they had a, a few key jumps, obviously like Jericho, which I don't even think he jumped. I think he was, you know, with new Japan. Um, but they had a few key jumps like Moxley. <clears throat> um, I think the week before us, maybe it was, uh, Matt Hardy. Um, but they hadn't really had any jump. So, so we can, you know, get the buzz off of us coming over. Right. The jump's you know, enough. Right. And then, and then we can build to this match. Um, so, you know, it was, we had sent some ideas back and forth to those guys uh, and Tony. And that's kind of, you know, where we left it. We, we had no right. expectation except for we were told that the division was going to be built around us and the Bucks. And we were told that, that doesn't mean we were never going to lose. It meant that we were going to be the two entities and they were going to put all the tag teams around us. And we were going to work with them and try to make and try to elevate all the tag teams. <clears throat> um, and we knew that, that eventually there was going to be a, a FTR versus Young Bucks match. And we all wanted to see it. But before you debut, I got to know, like, you had to come up with new names. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. and uh, I think you said on Twitter that it's a very demolition influenced. But were there any rejected names? Were there any things being kicked around in these second places? How did you get to Dax and Cash? No, we just, it was very, you know, like I said, Axe and Smash. We wanted to pay tribute to them. Dax and Cash. Plus, when I played football in high school, uh, I was, you know, they, they called me uh, David Dax, the Axe Harwood, that was because they knew I was a huge wrestling fan. And that's just what I was called there. So I decided to, to go with that. Um, and Cash, you know, like I said, he just we just were going to pay tribute to to tax and smash, and that was it. Nothing was rejected. Um, the only thing that was rejected was our initial FTR name. So I was going to ask about that. Is that something you want to talk about? The fear the revolt thing, and people had claimed thinks they had claimed to it. And there was a dispute. Um, we can edit it out or we can talk about it or you can just say you don't want to talk about it. Yeah, let's talk about it. We've never talked about it before. We've never discussed it before. We've always uh, steered away from it, but it's been three years. So and now, I talked to Mike Dawkins and Dawkins right. said, go for it. So now, I know these guys. I've seen them wrestle. I've seen them <laughs> wrestle a few times. Sorry. You know? um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, <laughs> as soon as you come out with Fear the Revolt, there's a – dispute with a, a tag team independent tag team mm -hmm. and um 
there were some negotiations, I think, that took place, and uh, they could have maybe uh, really benefited from the situation, um, but maybe didn't. Uh, what can you tell us about that whole revolt tag team thing? So uh, it was a tag team from the North Carolina Indies for, I don't know, I guess a year or so before we came uh, from uh, Caleb Conley from uh, Impact or mm -hmm. was an Impact or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and his partner, uh, Zane, Zane Riley, or Zane, Zane Riley. There you yeah, go. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Zane Riley. And uh, they called themselves the revolt. And I guess they had called themselves a revolt on uh, the North Carolina independence for a while. Uh, not, not that I guess. I know they did. And so our idea was me and Cash were the first guys in WWE to ask at the time to ask for our release. We wanted to get out, you know. And then if you see, you know, after us, not because of us, I'm just saying after us, a lot of guys started asking for the release or, or whatever, putting it on Twitter. They wanted to get out or whatever. But we were the, the first ones to, to ask for our release and, and make it known. And so, uh, you know, we were trying to think of FTR, uh, the, the acronym FTR, names for that. And Fear the Revolt was something I thought of because we, we, had, we had always said the, forever the revival, um, Fear the Revival. We had talked about that. But <clears throat> Fear the Revolt because we had revolted against WWE. And that's kind of the... the that's kind of the, the idea we wanted to put in people's minds that we were the guys to revolt against the big machine. And now we're coming to this company who is an upstart company and we're going to try to help make it, you know, whatever. <clears throat> and so we had videos made and trademarked the name. And then I get a tweet from Caleb Conley, or there's a tweet where we're tagged in it that said we had stolen their idea. Uh, I stolen their name. Excuse me. And I didn't, I didn't, you know, I didn't respond to it, didn't say anything to it. Uh, and then I got, a, you know, uh, maybe a couple of days later, I got a text from him. I said, this is Caleb. And I said, okay. And he said, are you guys going to be called the revolt? And I said, no, we're not going to be called Re revolt. We're going to be called FTR, which is going to stand for fear the revolt because we are revolting against the WWE, the big machine. And he said, well, that's my tag team name. And I said, dude, I had no idea that was your tag team name. I said, if you think for the last however long that you guys have been teaming, that I've been coming home on my day and a half off and looking up North Carolina independent wrestling instead of hanging out with my wife and daughter, I said, you're sadly mistaken, dude. Right. Uh, that's the last thing I was worried about was what sure. you and your partner or anybody else on the North Carolina independent scene or ind independence in general were doing. I wanted to make sure that, like, dude, I've told you before, like I got I had a caffeine addiction uh, where um, we're talking about it one day, but I literally thought that I was going to have a heart attack at an AEW show because I drank so much caffeine, but I had a caffeine addiction from being on the road so much. I would wake up, go to Starbucks, three coffees there, go to the gym, have a pre-workout workout, take a, take a, uh, either we'd go to the coffee shop to have a coffee on the way to the building for WWE show, have our match on the way to the next town, which was usually two, three or four hour drive. We would drink coffee or drink bangs until we got to the hotel room. I'd barely be able to sleep, wake up and do it all over the next, uh, the next day. And then when I got home with my family, I made sure to over cafe because I wanted to make sure my daughter knew that when daddy was home, at least he was home and he was there for everything. You know what I mean? And so I never worried about that stuff. I never thought about that stuff. So when he, you know, reached out to me about that, I looked up his, their tag team and I saw they had teamed like three or four times for one company, right? He was in, uh, I saw that he, Caleb was an impact. He was in ring of honor, uh, by himself, not with his team. And I said, well, are you guys going to actually team and use that name? Because I've only seen you do some of the bigger shows like ring of honor and, and the impact. And I can promise you that I would never, ever take a booking for a big show like that without cash because he's my partner. And uh, you know, they had no answer to that. And we, we had Dawkins talk to their lawyer and we said, look, we'll pay for your, uh, we, we will pay for your copyright as the revolt. So you can have the revolt. You'll be called the revolt. We will be called FTR and it will only mean fear the revolt. Then we will also give you a percentage of whatever merch we sell right. that has the name revolt on it. And they said, no, they didn't want that. 
and uh, we ended up winning and we got the name Fear the Revolt. But then Tony, who is such a great human being, said, look, let's not even engage in that. Let's let's give that name to them. You guys don't need that. If they feel so strongly about it, let them have it. So we couldn't have it. The only thing that upsets me, and I still hold this heat to all, to both of those guys, which I think I might have told you about WrestleCon when I saw Zane, Zane Riley in the bathroom. But um, the, the, the only heat that I hold towards them now is that I spent thousands and thousands of dollars to Mike Dawkins to take care of something we could have taken care of by ourselves, but I spent thousands of dollars to him that I could have given and put in Finley's college fund. You know what I mean? Or I could have taken care of the groceries for a couple of weeks or whatever. Um, that's the thing that I can't forget about and forgive. Eventually the, the, uh, fear the revolt FTR is ready to debut for a W May 28th. You're debuting, but it's kind of still uh, those quarantine years, right? Mm. Yeah. Did that, was, I mean, you know, you're probably thinking, damn it, it just, the pop, the crowd, that would have been so great. Yeah. Uh, was there a part of you that, that maybe wanted to wait that thing out and see if, if maybe you could do it in front of a live crowd? Uh, of course, I would have rather waited for crowds to come back, but, you know, at that time in 2020, which seems like yesterday and 10 years ago, all at, one, at the same time, you had no idea when there would be crowds back. You know what I mean? And you had no idea when things were going to go back to what we perceived to be normal. Um, and we wanted to capitalize on our name. Again, this sounds egotistical. I'm sorry, but our name value, um, what we had done with the Bucks online, we wanted to capitalize on that. But also, you know, more than anything, Tony Khan still had a television show he had to produce because right. he had this contract with right. uh, TNT and TBS, um, Time Warner Media, or whatever the name is. He had the contract with them. He had to produce content for them. If he didn't, he would be in breach of contract. And so, you know, he's got this new, these new talents that he's paying. And so we need to be featured on the show. Uh, so yes, I would have much rather, you know, uh, you know, it's 10,000 seat arena, but we, the cards we were dealt, um, we tried to make chicken salad out of it. Well, chicken salad is not a vegetable, but I'll tell you what is our new sponsor, which is a product that you use actually, Dax. I don't even know if you know they're sponsoring this episode. It is athletic greens, our new partner, our new sponsor, uh, AG1. I know you take AG1 by Athletic Greens, you know, as much as you possibly can. Um, and why did you give it a try? Dude, not as much as I possibly can. Every day. Every, every single day. Every day. I think, I think, you know, you, you listen to a lot of podcasts and you're like, oh, they don't try that. Come on, man. They don't do that. Athletic Greens, absolutely. I do it every single day. And not only do I do it, my wife does it. She tries. Uh, we've tried a lot of the green supplements before. And I can do, I can down anything. You know what I mean? Like, it, it doesn't bother me. Her, on the other hand, uh, she's a texture kind of person. So if it's a little too chalky or a little too clunky, she doesn't like it. Uh, uh, athletic greens my god there dude i cannot tell you enough how uh how good this is how good it tastes um obviously the ingredients inside of it are incredible uh the nutrients you get the vitamins you get the minerals you get from from just one scoop of athletic greens are incredible but i'm saying the taste actually is 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 good like, Perfect, yeah. and uh, that's very uh that's very shocking coming from a green supplement. But my wife, she takes the cup of greens. She puts, she has the water. She dumps the greens in there. Then she takes a squirt of, uh, I hate the word squirt. Oh my God. But she takes a squirt of uh, the lemon juice we have. She takes a frother that we have, jams it in there. She frothes it up, frothes, froths it up. And then she uh, downs the greens and she absolutely loves it. Uh, she thinks I'm this big deal now because we're stop sponsored by Athletic Greens too, which is pretty cool. She's calling me an in influencer i don't know what that is but that's pretty cool you know i think you might be you know so you take it uh, pretty much every day and your wife takes it uh as well how does it make you feel well i take it every day uh post-workout every single day i throw my athletic greens in there i put my creatine in there uh they also i also have the uh the vitamin d and the vitamin k supplement the, the liquid i put that in there as well um and then uh i just shake it up and just take it to go and do it so easy co so convenient uh no pills uh you know it's just it's it's a dream come true 
it's a co it's comprehensive health and the power of habit in one it's great for recovery and as you know and like you said you take it after you work out it empowers the gut for a whole body health and you know it inspires you to be as as great as as all the other athletes and all the other wrestlers that you've ever kind of admired and been inspired by um how does it make you feel? Well, the vi there, there's the vitamin D. There's a lot of vitamin B in there and a, vi a lot of vitamin D in there as well. And those two supplements are something that's going to up your metabolism, your natural metabol metabolism without crashing. You know, you get the, 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 the kick from uh, energy drinks or pre-workouts or whatever, and then you crash afterwards. And then that's because of the caffeine content is in there. This is the natural, uh, the, the natural energy that I absolutely love. And it takes me throughout the rest of the day. That's why I take it post-workout uh, because post-workout i'm able to one get my greens in at a, 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 a very important time because i've just broken down my body i've broken down my muscles and now i'm going to be able to to um, repair that with all the the vitamin supplements that are in athletic greens but also man those vitamins and minerals are what keeps me alert and keeps me awake through the rest of the day it's a micro habit that delivers macro benefits and helps almost everybody take great care of their health every day it costs less than three bucks a day which is is a pretty good uh, pretty good deal effective daily habit with the highest quality source ingredients it's a win-win if a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine then athletic greens is giving you a free one-year supply of that vitamin d and five free travel packs with your first purchase go to athleticgreens.com slash ftr that's athletic athleticgreens.com slash ftr check it out and as you heard mr dax harwood is a is a very enthusiastic endorsee of said athletic greens i love athletic anything that can give me uh a better peace of mind about my health and make it that simple that easy i'm all on board and as an athlete as an athlete it's very important you know you take care of your body your body is is the way you make your living and and you're very careful about the things you put in it especially uh tequila um, <laughs> lots, of, lots of great tequila talk going back to the show and going back to AEW and your AEW debut. It's set. The date is set for you mm -hmm. to debut. And we talked about how there's no crowd there. Um, what about the plan? The plan is, of course, the Bucks are in the ring. They just had a match. The Butcher and the Blade come in to attack the Bucks. And you come in, take care of the Butcher and the Blade. Don't really shake hands with the Bucks. You just kind of look at them, glare them down. As if, I, I think maybe narrative-wise, it's saying, hey, we're the badasses you need to watch out for. Look what we just did for you. You know, we just did it because we can. Right. So my thought process going in was was this. That that was an idea that I pitched that they I knew they were going to have the match with Butcher and the Blade. And I thought if we came in, uh, immediately the people are going to think we're going to jump the Young Bucks. But then we jump these guys who are attacking them because we wanted to make sure that whenever the eventual match happened with FTR and the Young Bucks, these guys were going to be 100% because we wanted to make sure that the fans saw and knew at the end of – the eventual match who the best tag team in the world was so that was the my thought process going into that and that's why we jumped uh butcher and blade my favorite thing is uh, you know we're gonna talk about the truck in a second but you guys pull up in the <laughs> truck and somehow magically tony shimani knows your new names oh my <laughs> god it's tax harwood cash wheeler yeah. <laughs> and you drive up in that old school truck uh we had a couple questions on twitter about the truck whose idea was that and who how'd you guys choose who drove uh well it was both of our ideas we <clears throat> we cash wanted something like uh like uh, we, we wanted to do it for eddie guerrero like the the to pay tribute to him but and cash wanted like a, a muscle car kind of thing and i was like ah, i don't know about a muscle car i think we should come in like an old dirty beat up truck and then we came to the agreement that it could be like uh an old truck but in a classic looking kind of way so that's how we came up with that and you know we thought it would make a statement especially in a covid environment where there were no fans um it's something people could remember uh, and then choosing who drove uh 
Cash is a stickler when it comes to to driving. He loves to drive and he wants to be the only one to drive. He says because if he if I drive or anybody else drives, he will fall asleep, and that's a no no. You don't fall asleep on the road. Uh, so he drives or he drove everywhere in between towns. Uh, you know whether it was an, an hour drive or a five hour drive, he was the one doing the driving. Um, so that's just how we came about it. He was he was our the wheel man all the time. You heard her here f- her first, folks. Daniel Wheeler is, in fact, a wheel man. He, Wheeler, Wheeler is a wheel yeah, man. Yeah, he, he was the wheel man for me, Elias, Chad, uh, and himself, obviously. We, were, uh, we always drove together. You come in the ring. You're, you're dressed to kick ass. You're, you kick some ass, and you, you finish off the Butcher of the Blade with a spike pile driver. Of course, a mm-hmm. move I don't think we would see in WWE. And an uh, interesting choice because we all know the big rig slash shatter machine is the go-to. What was the thinking in delivering a spike pile driver in that moment? Well, because, one, we were never able to to do that in WWE. We were never able to, to, to hit that move in WWE. We had been compared to Arn and Tully for our whole careers, you know, so wanted to pay homage there. But also we were, um, you know, we were already tied to the shadow machine. Everybody knew that was our move. Everybody knew that, uh, that was, that was how we were going to finish our opponents. So, this is our first time in front of an AEW audience. So we were allowed to show a new move that we could use for the future. You know what I mean? A new finisher we could use for the future. Sure. And we always had, we would always have the shadow machine in our back pocket. And you certainly use that a few times as you debut. Do you guys already know kind of the long-term plan for, you know, you and the bucks at the time, or was it, Hey, we're starting something. It's going to tell the story and we'll kind of figure it out as we go. Uh, it was a, it was a mix between the two because we all wanted, uh, uh, Tony included, we wanted to wait and have young bucks FTR one in front of a packed house. We wanted to wait for that. And, uh, we, we thought at the time when I came in, we thought that that would happen. You know, we thought it was going to happen soon. Uh, and then as time went on, we weren't really sure. And, um, you know, we, we had to pull the trigger, but we knew where we wanted to go. Um, it was about filling in the little holes that we, how we wanted to get there. And the debut happened, you do the Spock pile driver, you just stand off with the bucks. You're not really facing off. Like you're going to fight them. You're just saying we're here, we're here. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're a thing and we're a factor. And we just saved your asses. Uh, you guys get in the truck, you take off. Uh, that is the debut. How did you feel about it after it happened? What was the uh, general feeling? I loved it. I thought it, I thought it came off great. Um, we got to debut in the truck, which had never been done in AEW before. Um, not that I can recall. I'm sorry. Uh, it, it was a very memorable way to debut in the truck. Also, I think we had swerved the people a little bit because they expected us just to jump the young bucks and beat the, the hell out of them. Um, as they were getting jumped by butcher and blade, but we jumped them, got rid of them. Uh, and then the standoff with no handshake, nothing was to say, we're here. We're we're equals to you because fans understand this in wrestling. You know what I'm saying? Like I always kind of equate it to, to this. They understand this, uh, as a baby face, you know, when you're selling, you're down here and the heels here, but if you come up here and you're face to face, then you got to battle to fight because you got to figure out how to, if you're going to go back down to here, you got to figure out how to bring them back here. Um, so, so we understood that the fans got this and we were equals now and we just saved your ass from this because we want to have you, uh, at your best whenever it's young bucks versus FTR. Personally, for you and, of course, your best friend, the debut, how did it feel that, shit, we did it. We did it. Dude, we, we left the situation, and God, I hope it works out. Jesus, I hope it works. And th- next thing you know, you're on damn TNT television Dude, in a spotlighted way. Sitting in that truck, uh, I remember Cash looked over at me and said, we fucking did it. And we hugged in the truck, <laughs> and then he cranked up, and we, we went. And uh, we were just so proud of ourselves, man. Like, 
uh, we had a fresh slate. You know what I mean? We, we, we right, were able to, right. we were going to be able, or we thought we were going to be able to prove our worth to a national audience. We thought we were going to be able to, um, we were going to be able to, to help build this company that uh, we felt strongly about and thought they could uh, and still do. Obviously, they are providing a, an alternative to WWE. And, uh, you know, we were just, it was just so, such a proud moment for us. Uh, it was one of the times that we, you know, one of the many times we hugged and congratulated each other and said, we love you. Well, I have tons of questions, but I'm not going to ask them this week because we have questions on Twitter. We're gonna, I think we're going to go ahead and skip this week the non-wrestling question of the week. We'll start that again next week and keep right. that going because you tweeted, hey, anybody got any questions about our debut in AEW? And there's some great questions here uh, for you. Did you did you look at them yet or did you want me to pick a couple? Uh, I looked at a few of them, but you're, you're more than welcome to pick a couple. I can look okay. as well. I'm going to go with the first one I see because I like it. Uh, how were you received in the AEW locker room? Also, who were the coolest people backstage when you debuted? Uh, we were not... not. Mm, we were received okay. There were a few people, you know, and I've talked about it before, but there were a few people who weren't happy to see us, uh, didn't think we belonged. I also think that they felt oh, these guys aren't uh, homegrown AEW guys, or uh, they're not, they're not, uh, they're not uh, new AEW guys, or, or whatever. You know, they're not the original AEW guys. There we go. Uh, they're former WWE guys, and they're going to come in here and they're going to do their WWE stuff. So there are there's a quite a few people. You know, like I talked about when we first got there. I don't think Colt liked us very much, and he kind of made fun of us a little bit, and we had issues there. Uh, jungle boy who you know i consider a, a friend now uh, i haven't heard from him in a long time so maybe he's mad at me too about the podcast we'll see but uh yeah. you know he uh he wasn't happy to see us there there, there were a few guys the most welcoming the honestly the, the the most welcoming people were at the time were probably nick and matt um yeah, I would say, and, and then uh, Sean Spears too. Obviously, we had been friends with him for a long time. But Nick and Matt were were pretty welcoming. Um, Britt, she was uh, <laughs> so Britt was kind of upset with us because we had went on the Cornet podcast. But after we got over that right. little spell, she became a really good friend, and I I love her so much, man. She's uh, she's one of the good ones and she works her ass off and works her ass off to be really, really good. But also she's a great human being. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I think above everybody, it was probably Nick and Matt that were the, uh, you know, the most welcoming. And I think we should probably say, first of all, Sean Spears follows the show, retweets all of our stuff. I'm sure he listens. What a talent, but most importantly, congratulations oh, yeah. to Sean Spears, right? Yeah, I sent him a long text message and, uh, you know, said some. And of course, some, his wife, Cassie. Yes, yes, yes. Said some fatherly things to him and Cassie. Actually, I sent a group text to the both of them. Um, yeah, dude, uh, an incredible human being. Great person. Uh, always puts everybody before him. Always, always, always. Almost to his detriment, dude. Like, um, I, I, I wish I had a little bit of him and me, and I wish he had a little bit of me and him. You know what I'm saying? Right. Uh, and then right. we could, you know, we would be level headed, you know, e easy going, uh, good human beings or whatever. But uh, he is so sweet, so nice that he puts everybody's thoughts and everybody's feelings above his man. And uh, sometimes I'm like, I'm like Spears, you know, you Ronnie, you gotta, you, you, you gotta be selfish every once in a while, but he doesn't operate like that, dude. He's got a different brain than me and any other wrestler. He's, he's going to be an incredible father. Um, I could go on and on about his talents, uh, but none of the fans would fully understand how good he really is. Um, like there's, there are not too – he is Randy Orton-esque good as far as putting himself in the right position, um, never messing up, never blowing up, uh, you know, 
making things look so smooth, almost too smooth, which makes, you know, which, which makes people think that the other guy is the one doing the, the good work when it's actually Spears. Uh, so, yes, I, I don't mean to get on a tangent on him, but so incredible. The dude's a star, and he's oh, yeah. gigantic. He's a <laughs> mm-hmm. big dude, yeah. and he's got a star quality. He's got a magnetism to him, and I just think <clears throat> maybe just – do that you know because he's he's got that you know um he's he's really really great and congratulations on both of Mm -hmm. course you know cassie from the iconics but sean spears and thanks for listening and and he's got still 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 huge future ahead of him in wrestling um and a great he's a great trainer a great incredible trainer flatbacks training center in uh orlando florida check it out if you want to be a professional wrestler he's incredible at that he's with uh tyler down there tyler breeze Breeze. yep Uh, We'll take another question from Twitter. We had about 45 questions about this. Uh, Where's the truck, and is it coming back? Uh, So uh, I don't know where the truck is. I think it's in Jacksonville. Um, It was an incredible truck. It was beautiful. And Cash tried to buy the truck, but the guy was charged like – I think the guy thought we were like these multi multi millionaires. You got the tried, celebrity price, huh? Yeah, yeah. I think he I think he wanted Cash to pay seventy thousand dollars for the truck. Yeah, that's, and yeah, uh, Cash yeah. was like, no, nah, no, thank you. Uh, so the truck <laughs> is in Jacksonville. I would love to have it everywhere we go. I'd love to have a classic truck everywhere we go to make the entrance. But I think we've found our footing, and we. After the truck was over, they they asked if we wanted pyro, or they asked if they could give us pyro, and we said no, we don't we don't want pyro. That's not us, you know what I mean? Like, that's not who we are. <laughs> and so uh, now I think we've found our footing with the brand, or well, not brand new anymore, but the new FTR music, and just walking out in trunks and boots, and the people respect us for who we are, and we respect them back for who they are. Is it fair to say? that you would have preferred coming in a different way with a different program like you alluded to that earlier and looking back was this the right way to bring you in do you think i think so i mean we couldn't just come in and there not be any kind of altercation with the young bucks you know uh is what a lot of people consider the two best tag teams of a generation. You know, uh, I say that humbly. I also say that with as much ego as I can muster up to, because I really believe that the two, the two, two of the top tag teams of a generation. Um, and we couldn't come in and not, if, if we came in and didn't, uh, didn't confront the young bucks. I think the fans would have felt a little bit cheated, you know? Um, but we also had, again, towing that fine line. We had to find a way and figure out a way to not give them that match immediately because we had to, we, we wanted to capitalize on us uh, transitioning to AEW and, and, and figure out a way to strategically get to FTR versus young bucks. So I, I thought the debut came off well. Uh, And, you know, we came in as quasi baby faces, I guess. Um, And then we had a great match with the the next week with Butcher and Blade. I love that match. Love, love, love that match. Um, But, uh, you know, I was very, very happy with, except for the packed arena or having a packed arena. I was very happy with how the debut went and I was very excited for the future of FTR with AEW. And you got to empathize with Tony Khan in that situation for what we were saying earlier. You know, he's he's trying to put a show together. Like he's got to put all the bells and whistles he can. He's got to bring FTR and he's got to do the bucks because there's nobody <clears throat> out there except AEW wrestlers cheering. Yeah, I, I couldn't. I couldn't fathom the anxiety he oh my God, might right. have been going through on a week to week basis, on a month to month basis, on a day to day basis too, uh, trying to put together a television show uh, during the COVID ever COVID era. You know, brand new at this, completely brand new. And you know, we talk about AEW being a or in, it's in its fourth year of infancy now, um, but we we talk about that. But you think about it, the what. To, for for a year and a half or two years, it was during the COVID era, you know. Right, so yeah. you're still right now, like as we sit here and talk about the, about this in 2023, 
we're still on a learning curve for AEW, you know, still trying to figure things out because from 2020 to, you know, mid 2021 or whatever it was, I can't remember. Like it was a whole different ball game or a whole different atmosphere. Um, and now, you know, we're still trying to relearn um, how to present our style, AEW style of professional wrestling to a national audience. Well, that's the story folks. That is the AEW debut of FTR. I think we got to it all. I think so. And uh, we're drinking tequila Mm -hmm. and talking about the great Jay Briscoe. And I'm going to ask you now, do you have a match of the week, a Dax Harwood match of the week chosen? Oh, uh, of course I do. Yes. Uh, It is from August of 1994, Clash of the Champions, Ricky Steamboat versus uh, uh, Stunning Steve Austin for the United States Heavyweight Championship. Uh, My favorite WCW match of all time. I love that match. Uh, Hogan was just coming in. You know, he had just won the world title from Flair, and they were having a Flair versus Hogan match on this pay per view as well for the WCW world title. And I feel that uh, Steamboat and Austin were trying to steal the show and show the fans that, hey, we're, we're, what wrestling is about and i love that match the pacing the physicality uh uh, you know obviously the storytelling but but um how they transitions from how they transition from holds to high spots from high spots back to bringing the baby face down for a second to holding him in a hold and then bringing him up and giving him a hope spot that cups him out of nowhere because you think that's the comeback but it's not the comeback because he's making a small comeback but then he gets shut down and then he makes a small comeback and he gets shut down and a little, a little bit bigger comeback, but they get shut down again. So you don't know when the real comeback's happening. And then they do this long, intricate spot on the top rope where Austin um, Austin climbs to the top and he gets crotched on the top rope. Boom, by Steamboat, who's been down in the cell, right? Steamboat climbs up with him. Austin fights Steamboat off. Boom, boom, boom. Steamboat goes down. And then Austin's sitting there and Sweat is dripping off his nose and he's and he's you know sucking air. And that to me is professional wrestling. That one image where Austin's sitting on the turnbuckle, sweat dripping down his nose. That's professional wrestling to me. And then um Steamboat comes back up and he tries to get Austin. Boom, 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 boom. Austin takes him front, suplexes him off the top to the floor, boom. And you think this is time for Austin finally to to you know take back over on right. Steamboat. He comes off the top with a double axe handle, but Steamboat punches him in the gut. Bam, Austin sells that big, and it's so beautiful, dude. And if I'm not mistaken, they go from that where Austin gets bumped around just a little bit. Steamboat goes for a splash. Austin puts up the knees. Boom, and they're back in the cell. And that's the beauty of professional wrestling, and that's the beauty of storytelling when you can't follow it. Or excuse me, you can follow it, but you don't know where they're going. You know what I'm saying? That's what's beautiful about wrestling. So any baby face, any heel, uh, any fan that wants to enjoy wrestling. But if you want to see how, a, if you want to see the difference between a baby face, a quintessential baby face and a quintessential heel working together, the differences in selling the, 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 the pacing that they got, that's the match to watch. Uh, I love it. I can't speak enough about it. And um, that was steamboats last match for, what 15 years or something like that because yeah. that's where he broke his back until he came back in that uh, wwe uh, run much later after working nxt and you know yeah. doing a lot of stuff with jericho i'm gonna check that match out uh tonight and then and if that, you didn't know steamboat's last match was with me and cash but hey i did hear there. i yeah. did hear something about that I, hand-picked I we were I, hand-picked i almost went to that but Man, that WrestleCade was a long weekend. I don't know how you guys do it. You wrestled Bailey, and then you had to drive all these hours to get to the Steamboat Raleigh, match. And yeah. It was five hours out of my way, and I just had to get home. But I yeah. kind of regret it. Uh, <laughs> but I don't regret doing this podcast. I'm glad we could talk about Jay. Guys, of course, it's give, send, go dot com slash P-U-G-H love. That's give, send, go dot com slash pew love to support the family of Jay Briscoe. Uh, before we go, did you want to say any final words about your friend? Um, uh, you know, I can't say enough. I could talk about him all day. Um, <clears throat> a great human being, a uh, great man, uh, stood up for, for himself, stood up for his family. Everything he did was with his wife, 
daughter and son in mind. Every single step that he took, uh, every breath that he took, um, every decision that he made was for his family. He was, you know, very far down on the list. Sometimes he put other people above him that he probably shouldn't have, but, um, Everything he did was for them. And that's the character of a man. He worked every day for everything that he's got. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, obviously everybody knows, you know, they're, they're these uh, chicken farmers, but, uh, you know, never a day did he not work to make sure that his family is taken care of. And that's something, I think the reason the bond that we had, I think, uh, that's something that I will always respect about him and I will always love about him. Um, and like I said, because of him, because of his sacrifices, because of him wanting to work as hard as me and cash, uh, because of, of, of him wanting to make a name for himself, just like we wanted to make a name for ourselves, but above all, because he wanted to make sure his wife and daughters and son, me with my wife and daughter were taken care of. We wanted to be the best. So for years and years and years to come, we could take care of our families. And I want to share something cash sent me um, the other day uh, through text message. Uh, he sent me a text and he said that he was sent a quote from, uh, from the Briscoe's, busted open interview. Uh, I think it was a day or two after the uh, dog collar match <clears throat> and busted open. Uh, the Briscoes were asked if their trilogy with FTR in 2022 topped their storied careers. And Jay had this to say, that's a tough one. It's hard because this one is so fresh. It was two days ago. When we look back, When we look back, when we're old and retired and in the rocking chair, looking back, the trilogy of 2022, Briscoe's and FTR, it's going to be hard to beat. Jay's not going to get the opportunity to, to sit with Mark in a rocking chair now. Right. And that sucks. Uh, Mark, I will always have a rocking chair waiting for you outside. If you ever want to come hang with me and we can talk about this when we're 80 years old, I'll be here for you. Um, also, uh, cash and I, this is from last night. <laughs> oh God. Uh, we, if you can see, <laughs> he and I both took a shot, uh, at the same time. And the Texas for Jay, love you, brother. Uh, that was last night. Uh, our lives would not be the same without him. We only knew him for a year, but we got closer to him than a lot of other people in the business. And without him, uh, I don't think that my life in 20 years will be what it will be. So thank you, Jay. I love you. All right, by now, guys, you know, I love talking about old wrestling. What you might not know is it's not my real passion. My real passion is helping people save money. My real passion is getting families out of apartments and into houses. My real passion is getting people's finances aligned so they can retire on time. I hated going to Walmart and seeing the greeter being 80 years old. She should not be working. She should be home. Why is she still working? Because she still has a mortgage. I want to help avoid that for you. The other thing I want to help you with, let's make sure your kids don't get saddled with student loans. If you've got a student loan, why did you get one? Maybe because your parents still had a mortgage. I'm not saying that to be funny. I'm being sincere. There's only so much money to go around. What I want to help you do is figure out where you are right now and where you want to be long-term. And I do it at SaveWithConrad.com. I've been doing mortgages for more than 20 years. And during all that time, we've helped tens of thousands of families change their life. I mean, routinely, we're helping our podcast listeners save five, six, seven, eight hundred bucks a month, but more importantly, get them out of debt faster and with cheaper monthly payments. But if you don't think it can happen for you, let me just tell you this. 
We are not the bank. We don't say no. We say not yet, but here's how. We're going to get you a game plan on how to improve your credit, how to save a little bit of cash, and how to get into that dream house. Maybe you're already in the house, but it would be nice if someday we could put a pool in the back, or one day we want to upgrade the hardwood floors, or remodel the kitchen, or get a badass master bathroom. I can help you do all of that with no money out of pocket right now at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket. And if we can't help you save some cash, we won't waste your time. Check it out. SaveWithConrad.com, NMLS number 65084, equal housing lender. And hey, y'all, don't take my word for it. Check us out. We've got an A-plus with the Better Business Bureau. And as if that's not enough, go look at our reviews. Read them and weep, haters. ConradReviews.com. You'll see more than a thousand five-star reviews. Our average review is 4.72 stars. Find out how much money you can save. Take control of your life in 2023 by taking control of your finances. We're going to show you how to keep more of your own money. If you've got credit card debt, what are you paying on that? 14%, 28%, you know, you can do better with the mortgage though. You may not know this. The interest you pay is tax deductible. And we can even show you how to skip your next two house payments. So if you can get a lower monthly payment, pay your debt off faster, get a greater tax deduction at the end of the year. And right now, right after the holidays, skip your next two payments, buddy, this is the biggest no brainer in the history of the world. Find out how much money you can save right now for free at savewithconrad.com. Or Hey man, shoot me an email directly. Conrad at savewithconrad.com.